So this is part two of my three-part review of the Byte Electronic Load. There'll be links to parts one and three below when three is done, and there'll be copies of the slides available in the links below as well. So just a quick background, I bought this load in March of this year with my own funds to use in my lab and for future videos. I received no compensation for this review, nor did I give Byte any prior notice of this review. My main motivation for doing this is just so I can learn about the capability and limitations of this instrument. And this is the first commercial electronic load I have used, so I have no experience with other models or brands. Let's take a look at the hardware of this bite load. Anyway, the keys are very nice. Uh, they've got nice positive action. You, you hear them? They all feel good. This rotary encoder has definite steps, and it's clickable. Um, nothing to complain about there. I wish these uh, binding posts had banana plugs on them. You can see I made these uh, banana plug adapters when I first got it. And I may order some uh, binding, uh, some binding posts with banana plug adapters in the end from AliExpress. Um, these are six millimeter coarse thread. Um, uh, let's turn it off now. Um, here's the USB port. Uh, this handle uh, is clickable. It pulls in and out. comes in and out like this. Let's unplug it here. If we look at the back side, um, we can see here, here's the sense in logic outputs, the RS-232 terminal. It's got a switch to switch between... 110 and or 120 and 240 and the fuse is in there um, two fan outputs uh, the one thing I don't like about these uh, uh, um, DB9s or DA9s or I forget, or I forget you know the 9 pin D connectors that they're awfully close to this rubber bumper and so the the uh, the shell housing hits it luckily it's movable Anyway, these rubber bumpers are very flexible and they come off easily. So this is the uh, bottom side of the main board of the bytch load. All the PC boards in this unit are two-sided. So you can see over here to the right, on the top side are the current sense resistors, and here are the fat uh, plus and minus uh, pieces of metal that come from the front panel. And you can see they've added lots of solder to the traces to help carry the current. This capacitor down here on the bottom is really the only obvious bodge co wire component I can find on the whole unit. It's tacked on. There are no other obvious bodges I can see. Um, this is the power switch. Uh, there's one voltage regulator here on the backside, the 12 megahertz crystal for the uh, microprocessor. So this is the top view of the whole unit. You can see the main board, to, the main board here in the middle, the front panel off to the left, uh, the two uh, load uh, assemblies, and the power supply here. And up here in the top right is the I/O board. Now here's a close look at the power supply. You can see that the earth ground that comes from the sockets connected directly to the chassis with the bolt that bolts the, the transformer in place. And here's the 110-220 switch. Here's a close look into the transformer. You can see the, uh, the insulating tape and some of the wires coming out and some of the windings. Here's the other side. 
And if you look down below, all the primary inputs to the transformer feed from the bottom. The secondary outputs all are at the top. So again, here's a view of the whole uh, load again. Now let's look at the key power supply components. Again, here it's the transformer with four secondary windings, the 110, 220 switch. There's an X2 capacitor. Um, everything that's labeled DB107 is a, a uh, bridge rectifier. Um, there's a whole bunch of uh, analog voltage regulators except for there's one switching regulator and shot key diode and inductor right here and this switching regulator feeds the front panel everything else is uh, all the other supplies are linear and um, now if we look at this here's a x2 capacitor across the ac line common mode choke in series with the ac line power switch is up there these two linear regulators with heat sinks really run just about five to seven degrees above ambient. They run very cool. The current sense resistors are down here. There's a 560 volt varistor across the input. And there's also 2.01 microfarad capacitors, two kilovolts <coughs> that go from each side of the input to the chassis ground. Now there's a whole slew of integrated circuits on the the main board here and the uh, the load assemblies. Uh, key there's a 32-bit arm with 64k bit, bits of flash and two 12-bit DACs right here, uh, ST micro part. <coughs> there's one 16-pin DAC, which I assume drives these uh, loads. There's a 16-put ADC, <coughs> which is used for, for measuring voltage and current. And then a variety of op-amps on here, and then op-amps on each uh, load module. There's uh, these two opto-isolators I've marked here are the high-speed opto-isolators for the RS-232 port. Uh, well, the one, th one of the things I didn't like about this is a couple of the capacitors on this unit are the infamous Chong X capacitors, which do not have a good reputation. Everything else, it looks really good. Here's the relays. There's two relays, and these are range switching relays on the left. Uh, there's two voltage ranges and two current ranges for the load, and you, when you change those, you hear the relay click. And then this relay at the right is the uh, it, remote sense or local sense for the voltage. Uh, so the voltage sense relay that switches between the contacts on the back or the internal. And it's rated for, it's tested to a thousand volts AC between the open contacts for a minute. It has no long-term rating, but that, that, that's, this is what's in the specs. Now, there's two types of bipolar transistors used throughout this unit. Most of them are this general purpose type, and they all say 1AM, and this is the part number. And then there's uh, several of these that are marked RO, and these are a kind of a, a VHF amplifier. But the specs are not that different. I think the main reason they're using them is these are binned by beta, and wherever they use these, they're looking for a specific beta range. So these, these transistors are binned by beta, where these have a much wider range that they can see. All the diodes in this unit, except for that one shocky rectifier are, and the bridge rectifiers are MELF, high reliability MELF diodes. Every resistor, except for a couple of the power resistors are 1%. So the electronic load input circuit basically looks like this. These are the terminals on the front. There's a 560 volt varistor across there. There's 2.0. 01 microfarad capacitors, one from each side to chassis ground. Um, this negative terminal is the local ground in the circuit. There's a 2.2 microfarad and 1 ohm uh, resistor in series as a snubber. And this is the capacitor I was measuring in part one of this review. Here are the current sense resistors. And then there's eight of these MOSFET op amp circuits on the two heat sinks, four on each of the two heat sinks. 
So if we look here, this is the top of one of the two heat sinks. And this is the one without the temperature sensor. Uh, the other one has a slightly bigger connector and this spot here is populated with a temperature sensor. This is a quad op amp. So there's one op amp for each of the four MOSFETs. You can see the MOSFET, the bottom of the MOSFETs is here on each side. And then there's four uh, 0.1 ohm 8 watt resistors. And these are very conservatively used. If you assume 30 amps is spread between the eight resistors, the maximum power dissipation in these resistors at 30 amps will be 1.4 watts. Anyway, this is a close-up of the quad TL074. Uh, one section drives each of the four MOSFETs. Uh, and here's a couple of transistors and some diodes on the circuit. I haven't on the, on the uh, load circuit. And these are the MOSFET transistors. They're all Siliconics IRFP 460s, 500 volt devices rated at 13 amps, uh, 0.27 ohms max RDS on, and 280 watts with a D rating of 2.2 watts per degree C, and a junction to case of 0.45 uh, degree C per watt. In use, the maximum power dissipation these things will see if you assume that all 300 watts gets dissipated in the MOSFETs and ignore the other resistors would be 37 and a half watts. So that, and the heat sinks you saw were pretty beefy. So this is very conservative use of these devices. Now here's a thermal image using my uh, newly acquired UT260B. And you can see here, here's the thermal image of the, here's the two uh, heat sinks with the fans on the end. You can see that the uh, UT, that the uh, Unit T thermal camera says 69.7. Don't believe it. That can't, uh, the one I got reads consistently higher than the actual temperatures. The actual temperatures of the hot spots there are about 56 degrees. And when I took this picture, it was dissipating 260 watts for over an hour. Now here's some other thermal images of the part. So these are these two regulators back here. And here you can see I have a Tektronix uh, PT100 probe plugged into my Keithley meter, which is set up to read the PT100 probe. It's with easily within half a degree C and it's up against the heat sink. The, the, uh, the, Unity camera says 44.3 when actually it's 30 degrees C. And I put my finger on it and it didn't even feel warm because 30 degrees C is about the temperature of your finger. So again, here's the back panel of the unit. You can see here's the the uh, plug that comes in. The, the fuse holder is integrated there. It's a 20 millimeter, one amp, 250 volt, uh, a fast blow fuse. It's kind of an odd size. It's not the little teeny size. It's not the full size. It's an F1 AL. I don't have any of those in stock. So if I ever needed to replace it, I'd have to order them. Now there's two DA9 connectors on the back. This one's for the voltage sense as well, the, the digital IO and the RS-232. The main problem with these is that you can see here, if you have a shell on your connector, it pushes out on this rubber bumper. These connectors will be placed too close to the edge. This is the digital IO board that's on the back of the unit here. You can. Um, and you can see the cables that come off over here. Here's the back of the main board. Now this is the digital I.O. board removed. So you can see uh, what's on it. This cable here comes from the external voltage monitor input. These are opto isolators for the digital I.O. that's shared with the voltage monitor input. And this is the RS-232 driver, but the opto isolators for that are on the main board. So my issue with this is on this ribbon cable, and the ribbon cables are typically rated for 300 volts, is there's non-isolated digital signals mixed with the isolated RS-232. And this, uh, uh, and then this connector here, 600 volt rating. 
And they quoted me a thousand volts isolation, and I'm sure it uh, tested to that when you know they did their high pot test in in the uh, at the factory. But I have my doubts that it would be able to sustain that long term. Anyway, so here's a view of the whole unit. Here's the back of the main board. So under here's the second M, uh, uh, 32 bit. Uh, microcontroller, a reset switch for it. And I assume this battery is for the real-time clock. If we look closer, you know, there was a ribbon cable. This ribbon cable goes up to from the main board to the front panel. And all the connectors on this have this red goop on there, which I haven't pulled off, but it looks to me like it's red hot glue. This is the front panel uh, connectors. You can see here the beefy pieces of metal that come to the main board. And then these two wires are the sense leads for the, uh, for the input connectors. And they're really doing a good job of sensing as close to the input as possible. Now, the one thing here is you can see here is there's a, an extra hole here. You know, though it's partially blocked by this board and the one thing I, I wish it had the sense uh, leads on the front I'm glad it has voltage sense that was a requirement for me buying it but uh, it's not easy to access on the back so I was wondering if I could use this so I wanted to see how ho wide that hole was so what I did is I took a flashlight and put it behind it and then just measured on the front here and so it's a 14 millimeter diameter hole with flats on the top and bottom and the distance flat to flat is 10 millimeters So now I want to show that the uh, negative terminal is the common ground for this device. So if we look here, you can see I have one lead of the multimeter. Let me scan that up. It's hooked to the negative terminal. I've got it on buzz mode. So let's go here. Getting 0.17 ohms. Let's go to ground on the board. 0.12 ohms. Let's find another ground somewhere. Maybe here, yeah. 0 0.1010 ohms. Let's look at, well here, this is through the resistors. 0 0.10 ohms. Yeah, those resistors are pretty small, so that's the ground here. Now what's very interesting is let's plug this into the USB port. This is a little test uh, jig I have that allows me to monitor the power connections on a USB port. So the USB port is connected to here. So if you're floating this or the ground is above or below ground, your USB port for your thumb drive is also going to be above or below ground. And that could be interesting. So you have to be aware of that. So let's talk about some quality control issues I found with this load. First off, when I got it, I noticed this kind of uh, coloration on the display at certain angles. Now you can see here as I rub it with my finger it appears to be a uh, kind of loose uh, extra liquid crystal liquid that's stuck in the display. Um, I mean outside this is this uh, really lowers the perception for the outside of the quality of this instrument to see this on the display. Now again, let's look at the input signal, or the input circuit here. And you can see here there's this snubber on the input, which is 2.2 microfarads in well, 1 ohm. And it's, this load's rated to 360 volts, so you'd expect at least a 400 volt capacitor there. I would have used 630 since there's this 560 volt varistor, but that's just me. But surprise, surprise, when I opened it up and I looked at the capacitor, so you can see here, here's the resistor in the capacitor. The capacitor actually was only rated for 250 volts. So I emailed Byte about this, 
and they sent me back uh, a message basically saying that uh, they have their, their boards farmed out they don't actually make their boards in house. I'm pretty sure they just get these pieces in. Uh, you know, they they have modular designs and assemble the modules depending on what people order. And uh, he said that the fact is they tested the board and that the capacitor passed the short term test, but they advised me to replace it if I'm going to be using it at above 250 volts. Just okay. I mean. I would have liked it if they had sent me the correct capacitor, but, you know, they at least acknowledge their, their error and so they say they'll fix it. So what I did is I ordered a Panasonic 630-volt uh, capacitor from Mauser and installed it in the board, as you see here. Now, the other issue I had with quality control, as you can see here, is this heat sink down here is bigger than the footprint it shows on the board, and it's jamming into the side of this filter capacitor here. So this heat sink's pressing up against this filter capacitor, kind of digging into the side. That just is not a good thing. So here's another view. You can see the heat sink pressing up against the filter capacitor. So I pulled the heat sink out, and so you can see here, this is the edge that was against the capacitor, and here's where the heat sink was pressing against the capacitor. They put a little bit of silastic on there, but and you can see some marks, but there's no dent there, so I just left it for the moment. And so what I did is I ground off that portion of the heat sink and then reinstalled it. So you can see here it's reinstalled, and I now have a gap between the two. Um, I'll make a, I actually am going to post a supplementary video of me showing the review, but that'll be extra to this. Anyway, so let's talk about the architecture of the load. It's got a two 32-bit ARM microcontrollers. There's an MCU on the main board with a 500 kilohertz 16-bit A to D to measure the voltages and a 16-bit D to A to set the current in the 8-bit MOSFETs. There's an other MCU on the front panel that runs the GUI keyboard display and RS-232 communications. And there's four sub-assembly types. There's the main board with the power supplies and test MCU. All the power supplies on that are linear except one that feeds the front panel. And it provides the control voltage to the load modules. There's a front panel control MCU with the LCD display, keyboard, rotary, quarter, and USB port. A rear panel interface board with the isolated RS-232 port and isolated digital interface external voltage input. And then there's two MOSFET load boards on the heat sinks, each with four 500 volt 13 amp MOSFETs. And one of them has a temperature sensor. So what did I learn from this teardown? Let's first talk about the aspects of the hardware I liked. It, had, it was designed with excellent thermal management, which is something you really want to see in a load. It has mostly high-quality components, name brand semiconductors, very nice keyboard with bright LEDs under it, almost all the resistors are 1%, and it was designed for easy repair. It's simple disassembly, connectorized modular design, all standard components, so if something goes wrong in the future repairing it, it's not going to be a big deal. It's got a properly grounded dual line voltage uh, linear supply, and it's a standard half rack 2U case, so it'll stack neatly with under other instruments. And the air intake is on the sides and the exit on the back, so unlike some uh, some old HP stuff I have, you you don't have to worry about stacking stuff above or below it since the air in, since there is no air that flows through the top or the bottom. What are the aspects of the hardware I disliked with this unit? Poor production quality control, the excess liquid in the LCD display, the heat sink corner pushing up against the filter capacitor and the underrated capacitor on the input snubber. There's a few questionable components, a couple of the infamous Chong X capacitors, uh, the uh, DA9 connectors on the back panel are of marginal quality. And a very questionable 1,000-volt isolation rating. I'm sure, again, that the thing tests, you know, high pot tests to a 1,000 voltage, no 
problem, but I have a hard time believing it's going to hold up over time if you run it that way. You know, the 300 volt rated ribbon cable, the 600 volt connectors on the back, and the fact that the USB port on the front is hot. Anyway, this is uh, the end of this review. If you like this review, please subscribe and you want to see more from me. If you want to make sure to be notified of the part three, please click the notification bell and give it a thumbs up if you liked it. Anyway, I am thank you for listening and uh, hope you uh, see my next review. Bye-bye.